1992. By far the biggest release of this week and month was easily The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, released April 13th, 1992. After the universal acclaim of the original and positive reception of Zelda 2, it was a hotly anticipated title for the Super Nintendo. This time it calls you to the ultimate battle of good against evil. To a quest few are prepared for and fewer still survive. But perhaps now the power is within your grasp. It's the game that's already a legend. The Legend of Zelda, a link to the past, only on the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Now you're playing with superpower. It quickly became one of the standout titles on the Super Nintendo, and my personal favorite of the Zelda games. The main selling point of Link to the Past was the Dark World mechanic. This was an entirely separate world map, complete with seven additional dungeons compared to the three dungeons of the Light World. For the time, this was insane. I remember fighting Aghanim and feeling like it was the final boss, only to find out there's an entire second world to complete. This came as a surprise to anyone who bought the game, because even though it came with a world map, it only shows the Light World. So even at the time, we thought this was all there was. Unless, of course, you opened up the little Black Book of Top Secrets, which was sealed for all the hardest puzzles in the game. And if you open it up, right inside, it mentions the Dark World. So even in 92, we couldn't avoid spoilers. There's a Dark World! Did you know that Nintendo Power held a contest in 1990 that would grant the winner a cameo in an upcoming NES game? Note that I said NES and not Super NES. And that brings us to the Chris Houlihan room. To this day, there has been no official confirmation of who won the aforementioned contest and whether or not Chris Houlihan is even an actual person. The fact that his name was removed from the Game Boy Advance port of Link to the Past makes this all the more suspicious. Nonetheless, the room still exists. The official method of finding it involves performing very specific steps to manipulate the game's memory to teleport there. Well, good luck finding that without a guide. In fact, I'm pretty sure no one ever found the room until Nintendo Power themselves told everyone how to find it. And even then, I don't think I actually did it until, what, 2010? To this day, A Link to the Past is finally regarded as one of the defining games of the Zelda franchise, second only to Ocarina of Time. Many of the elements that we associate with the series, going into dungeons, getting an item to beat the dungeon's boss with, puzzles, a greater emphasis on story, all debuted here. It's been ported to the Game Boy Advance and made available for download anytime Nintendo had any kind of virtual console. It still has an active community thanks to speedrunners and all kinds of randomizers. I still personally remember the day that I got it, because it was the same time that we got a camcorder for Christmas that year. Naturally, my older brother took the camcorder and was just filming anything and everything he could, and he went upstairs into my room, and there I sat, looking into a little 12-inch CRT television. I was playing The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past. In fact, I'm pretty sure in that footage, I still got 10 arrows. Leaving the past, we look forward to the future, with Mutant Virus on the NES. The story goes like this. In the future, just about everything is dependent upon the CPI complex, an artificial intelligence responsible for just about everything technological. So when it gets infected by a computer virus, things get kind of nutty. Thus, our hero, Ronald W. Trainer, is shrunken down to face the virus head on. At the time, the game was fairly impressive for its cutscenes and visual effects. As for the gameplay, holy friggin' crap, this game is insane! It's like a turbo version of Asteroids combined with the presentation of Ninja Gaiden. And I never even knew this game existed until I researched it for the show. Seriously, did anyone have this game as a kid? Or is this one of those late release anomalies? I'm sure it appears on some top 10 underrated NES games list somewhere. This was publisher American Softworks Corporation's first game they ever made. And it's impressive for how ambitious they went for it. Seriously, the SNES was already out for a few months, and the final few NES releases were typically all platformers. If nothing else, Mutant Virus Stands is an interesting technical achievement for the NES, and it's worth checking out for that reason alone. Enough of that science stuff, let's take it to the streets! An iconic beat-em-up game came to the Sega Genesis, Double Dragon. Now I, and many others, fondly remember the NES version of the game. That's the same version that they showed off in the movie The Wizard. 
he some kind of freak or something? It was single player, you leveled up, and the only two player mode was a dumb versus mode. However, the Genesis version was not a port of that. It was an arcade accurate conversion. It looked like the arcade version, it sounded like the arcade version, and most importantly, it played like the arcade version. Most home ports of Double Dragon lacked the ability to play co-op, one of the defining features of the arcade game. So when the Genesis version came out with co-op, it was a pretty big deal. At the time, this was the closest you could get to having the arcade version at home. This includes once you beat the final boss, having to fight the second player at the end. It was also a big deal that it came out for the Sega Genesis at all, a staggering four years after the NES version. Now in the 90s, Nintendo had a tyrannical possessiveness when it came to their exclusive games. They had a mandate that any third party game could only be on a Nintendo console for a minimum of two years. Plus, by 1992, a little guy named Sonic the Hedgehog kind of helped things out. Hey, did you know that Double Dragon had a cartoon show? It sucked. Yes, Billy, I am the Shadow Boss. One of the most popular game genres at the time was the beat-em-up, made famous by games like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles arcade game and Final Fight. This spawned many copycat clones, including Rival Turf, released for the Super Nintendo on April 23rd, 1992. It has everything you'd expect from a beat-em-up game, walking from left to right and punching the ever-living crap out of every single dude who dares to walk on the screen. You sometimes pick up health items or weapons, then fight a boss at the end of the stage. And that's pretty much the whole game. So how do you get a game like Rival Turf to stand out against all the other competitors? That's easy, with box art. Look at this. This is the most 90s box art I could possibly think of. Leather jackets, backwards baseball caps. This is perfect. It worked too. Imagine me at seven years old, walking into a blockbuster for a game to rent, seeing this box art and thinking to myself, oh, cool kids. I want to be a cool kid. Watch out, mom. I'm going to be hanging out with the badass 14, maybe 15 year olds. Funnily enough, I think these two are supposed to represent the two playable characters in the game, who are named Jack Flack and Ozzy, sorry, Uzi Nelson. Ugh. And that's not the only thing that got changed in translation. In Japan, this game is known as Rushing Beat and is actually the first part in a trilogy of games. However, the Western rival Turf had all the cutscenes completely removed. Its sequels did make it to the Western market, where you may know Rival Turf 2 and 3 as Brawl Brothers and The Peacekeepers. Only now those games are completely unrelated and have their character names changed further. What makes Rival Turf better than something like Final Fight? Absolutely nothing. In fact, it's way more boring compared to any other beat-em-up game. Even reviews at the time were super unimpressed. It's so painfully mediocre that it's super forgettable. So how does it keep showing up everywhere? In 2011, it was made available on the Wii's Virtual Console. It was also put onto the Wii U's Virtual Console in 2015. And in 2017, Retrobit released a special SNES cartridge that included Rival Turf and its sequels. But how? The owner of the game, Jalico, went out of business in 2014. So who keeps getting this re-released? Oddly, the one thing I remember the most was the boss on the third stage. He was this hockey mask wearing boss and he would jump on the fence to taunt me, but like, he's definitely just giving me the finger, right? That wasn't the only game that came out this week with a completely different cover in the US. There was also Elysia Dragoon, released for the Sega Genesis. The gameplay has you playing as Elysia, running and jumping while blasting every single enemy you see with some fantastic magical effects. She also has familiars following her around with their own different abilities and ways of helping. I can't stress how great this game looks and plays. The large character sprites are sweet and the lightning shots are so satisfying to hit enemies with and the soundtrack is awesome. Now, in the 90s, publishers weren't convinced that gamers over here would want to play a game that has an anime character on the cover, let alone a girl. That's one of the reasons why Mega Man 1 and 2 had such weird box art. The same also applies to Elysia Dragoon. The Japanese box art is really, really cool and very evocative. But I gotta hand it to the US box art here. I love this style of 90s, where every dude is shirtless and super buff, and every woman is mostly shirtless and also super buff. 
While I wasn't able to confirm it, this art style is very reminiscent of Boris Vallejo, who also did the box art for games like Golden Axe 2 and Eternal Champions. And if it wasn't him, it very well could have been his wife, Julie Bell. If anyone knows for sure, please let me know in the comments down below because I would love to find out. Because this box art, it's fantastic. Did I mention that Studio Gainax designed the characters for this game? You know, the same studio who also did Neon Genesis Evangelion. Sadly, Elysia Dragoon didn't exactly light up the sales charts. I think it's safe to say that most people either didn't know it existed or chose to ignore it. Seriously, I flipped through several issues of EGM around the time and I couldn't find a single mention of it. Not a review, not an advertisement, not even a cheat code. However, it must have some form of a cult following of an underappreciated classic. When Sega released the Sega Genesis Mini in 2019, included right on there was Elysia Dragoon. Over on the NES, we saw the release of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Pool of Radiance. It's fundamentally a first-person dungeon crawler where you and your party travel through dungeons and towns. You'll talk to NPCs and when battle occurs, switch to an overhead turn-based strategy to do combat. These battle screens aren't just random walls popping up. The battles take place where you are on the map, down to every single hallway, door, and corridor. While other D&D games for the NES up to this point were either a stupid platformer or a stupid side-scrolling whatever, Pool of Radiance was a faithful port. Originally, it appeared for MS-DOS computers as part of what's known as the Gold Box D&D games by developer SSI. And that game was massive, making its appearance onto the 8-bit Nintendo downright impressive. Not only that, it still retained all the best things, being able to create your entire party and do battle with an incredibly accurate version of the advanced Dungeons and Dragons first edition rule set, complete with Thacko. It may graphically leave a few things to be desired, but the NES version of Pool of Radiance does have a few things going for it that the computer version doesn't. For one, it has music everywhere. And that's it, I guess. It certainly isn't better than the home computer version, but AD&D Pool of Radiance on the NES is a great version of an already great Dungeons & Dragons game. Home ports of arcade games were frequent on these retro consoles, especially if it featured money-printing superheroes. One of the biggest of said adaptations was Captain America and the Avengers, first released on the Sega Genesis in April 1992. First released in the arcades back in October of 1991, it's a cooperative beat-em-up with the arcade version featuring four players and four playable characters, Captain America, Iron Man, Hawkeye, and Vision. Except nobody wanted to play as Vision. It's pretty typical beat-em-up action. Punching enemies, everyone has a ranged attack, and sometimes you throw stuff. Captain America and the Avengers saw a fair number of ports, with the first one being on the NES, but that was more of a platformer. The Sega Genesis was the first one to get an arcade-accurate port more than a year before the Super Nintendo version, and then months after that, it would come to the Game Gear and the Game Boy. However, this is one of those instances where the Genesis version is leagues better than the SNES one. The Sega version looked pretty good, played great, and was still a pretty fun two-player romp. It even kept the complete nonsense broken English translation. The SNES version may have looked better, but it was straight up missing sound effects, the hit detection was incredibly poor, and all kinds of not fun. So yes, it's true, at least with Captain America, Sega did what Nintendo didn't. By far my favorite thing about Captain America and the Avengers wasn't just playing as my favorite superheroes or even the co-op gameplay. No, my favorite thing about Captain America was that anytime any player took any damage, the game would shout, No! No! Go ahead, try it, it's fun. No! No! The Genesis got another game this week, and stop me if you've heard this one before. An action platformer where your player character has a whip taking out all kinds of enemies before them. That's right, we're talking about Ernest Evans. You play as Ernest Evans as he goes through several levels of action, whipping everything in the way. And by whipping, I mean going completely bonkers with it. You remember how in Super Castlevania 4, if you held the attack button, you could just jiggle the whip all around? Yeah, it's like that, but the entire game. Even the movements are super awkward. This dude's a better contortionist than he is a whip fighter. 
this game walked so that Quop could awkwardly fumble. Interestingly enough, there is an explanation for this. Unlike most games, Ernest Evans used multiple interlocking sprites for its player character. Each of his limbs are separately rendered. At the time, this was pretty ambitious. Though, as you can see, it didn't actually work out all that well. It's the kind of thing that tends to fit better for larger sprites. Gameplay-wise, Ernest Evans is a pretty standard action platformer. GamePro considered it to be good, but not exceptional. This game has an interesting history behind it, to put it lightly. For starters, the version that we got was an inferior one. In Japan, Ernest Evans was on the Sega CD, complete with fully voiced anime cutscenes done by Studio Madhouse. In America, the Sega CD wasn't out yet, so it was downgraded to the Genesis. Though aside from the cutscenes and a musical downgrade, it's not massively different. What was massively different was the box art. In Japan, we got the titular character standing there and looking cool at the adventure before him. And in the West, we got Indiana Jones. That is Indiana Jones. It's like the artist heard Guy with the Whip and decided, I am not getting paid enough to try. The story was also changed between the Japanese and the US releases. In the Japanese version, Evans is a treasure hunter recruited to find the Necronomicon. Real life figures Calvin Coolidge and Al Capone were involved in the plot. In the American version, it's changed to your typical collect the MacGuffins to stop the big bad evil guy. You also play as Evans' grandson, who looks exactly like him. Ernest Evans was the second game in a trilogy, with the first one being El Viento, which was released on the Genesis a year earlier, and the third one being Annette Futatabi, which we never got over here in the West. All three were developed by the studio Wolf Team, who you probably know better for making games such as Tales of Fantasia, Tales of Symphonia, Tales of Vesperia, Tales of Zelia, pretty much almost all of Namco Bandai's Tales of series. The music was also done by Matoi Sakuraba, who you've also heard the music in Golden Sun, Mario Golf, Mario Tennis, and a little game series called Dark Souls. The Genesis release train this week doesn't stop there, as there was also Sid of Valis. Known as SD Valis in Japan, it's more or less a remake of Valis 2, which was originally released on the TurboGrafx CD two years prior. The SD standing for Super Deformed, Sid of Valis is less a remake and more a demake. The run and attack gameplay is largely intact, but the original Valis 2 had an in-depth story told through cutscenes that were fully voiced. In 1990, this was the coolest. And unlike most voice acting of the time, it hasn't aged too poorly. As a result, Valis 2 got decent reviews. Sid of Valis, however, did not. The gameplay was made far more simple and the story lost a lot of its edge. At the time, the chibi art style was considered too childish for us cool gamers, and since it was silly, it was clearly aimed at people already fans of the series. The heroine, Yuko, was also incorrectly named as Sid. As a result, it received mediocre at best reviews from magazines. Remember what I said earlier about games having their box art radically altered for the release overseas? Well, Sid of Valis takes that a step further. While the box art was certainly changed, it's not even Valis anymore. Instead, they reused the box art from a completely different game called Naritori Sogoroku 92, which was a Japan-only release for the PC Engine or the TurboGrafx-16. Why did they do this? I don't know. Laziness? I'm gonna go with laziness, as evidenced by the fact that the Western release of Sid of Valis's end credits are still in Japanese. Yes! The Batman Returns handheld electronic game. If you grew up in the 90s, or really any decade after the 50s, you probably remember at least one Hanna-Barbera cartoon. The Flintstones, The Jetsons, Scooby-Doo, tons of these got video game adaptations. And this now includes Wacky Races, released for the NES, May 1st, 1992. I didn't really personally grow up with Wacky Races, but it was on reruns all the time on the early days of Cartoon Network. And even then, as a kid, I thought to myself, this is kind of dumb. Better watch out, Dick. Why? You're approaching the end of the bridge. <laughs> As the name implies, the cartoon was all about crazy characters racing their equally crazy vehicles, finding themselves in silly situations often caused by the villainous Dick Dastardly and his dog, Muttley. The pair got their own spin-off show in 1969 that lasted 17 episodes, so they must have figured, well, the video game should capitalize on their popularity. You know, 23 years later. So with a cartoon that literally has races in the title, you would think it would be adapted into a racing game. Nope, that would make too much sense. 
Instead, Wacky Races is a completely normal platformer game. Seriously, it's like there was some contract that said licensed games at the time had to be turned into platformers. Oddly, you play as the villainous dog Muttley trying to rescue Dick Dastardly. At the end of each level, there is a boss fight, one for each of the other racers from the cartoon. Evidently, this was a big enough deal that Nintendo Power made it one of their main featured games in their May 1992 issue. They felt it needed a walkthrough for every single level, even though it's a baby game for babies. In the same issue, Nintendo Power reviewed it rather favorably, giving it a 3.3 out of 5. The only other thing notable about Wacky Races is that it was developed and published by Atlas. Yes, that Atlas. In Japan, they were already known for making games like Digital Devil Saga, and later in 1992, they would release the first Shin Megami Tensei game. Meanwhile, in the West, Atlas was more known for developing games like TurboGrafx-16's Dungeon Explorer and the NES titles... <sighs> The Karate Kid, and Friday the 13th. They've come a long way since then. Also released this week was the Game Boy game Batman Return of the Joker. Not to be confused with Batman Beyond Return of the Joker, that was released for Game Boy Color, and in the year 2000, totally different games. Also of note, this was more or less a sequel to the Tim Burton Batman movie, as the revered animated series wouldn't debut until September of 1992. Released after the NES version last December, Return of the Joker on the Game Boy was a shrunken down port. It's a bit smaller with only four stages instead of seven. It went with a Mega Man style of progression. Complete the first three stages in any order to unlock an additional final one. More importantly, the shooting elements were removed, so now it's just a straight up platformer. It ends up playing more like Sun Soft's first Batman NES game more than anything. Despite the simplification, it's still reviewed pretty well. Electronic Gaming Monthly praised it for its gameplay, its graphics, and its music. Nintendo Power also rated it fairly well, giving it an average of a 3.6 out of 5. Now that doesn't sound very high, but later in the 1992 Nintendo Power Awards, Batman Return of the Joker topped the categories for graphics, sound, and challenge alongside heavy hitters like Kirby's Dream Land and Super Mario Land 2. The only category that it didn't even make the top five was theme and fun. Reviews used to make no sense at the time. The theme is Batman, therefore it is automatically fun. The only non-Nintendo game also released this week was Ballistics for the TurboGrafx-16. Originally released in 1989 for the Amiga and Atari ST personal computers, the gameplay of Ballistics is simple. Move the ball into the goal by shooting other balls at it. It's a very short game, but it does innovate with plenty of gimmicks and computer opponents. Also, I really dig the guy who places the ball. He looks like a heavy metal mascot, and he intimidatingly says, Let the game commence. Let the game commence. One interesting change made in the home console version was that you actually control a character. In the PC versions, you controlled a cursor. See, that's what makes the TurboGrafx-16 version so much better, because it's easier for you to tell what's going on. You can tell what's going on, right? Because I'm playing it and I have no idea what's going on. In spite of these unique concepts, Ballistics was not treated too kindly. Electronic Gaming Monthly reviewed it with an average score of a 4.75 out of 10, criticizing its slippery controls and uninteresting gameplay. One reviewer described the guy who places the ball as utterly adolescent, and that was the one who was the nicest about the game. Hey, wait a minute! A game where you try to get the ball into your opponent's goal by shooting other balls at it? This is just a game adaptation of Crossfire! It's some time in the future. The ultimate challenge. Crossfire. Crossfire. You get caught up in the crossfire. Crossfire. You get caught up in the crossfire. 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 You'll get yeah. caught up in it. Fun fact, Crossfire originally came out in the 70s. They reinvented it to be rad for us 90s kids. The ballistics box art is just as metal. Look at how awesome this is. You got this dragon guy flying with some missiles. He's got this steam engine wing thing going on and this sword. This would make such an awesome metal album cover. 
because it is a metal album cover. This is the exact same art that was used for the 1984 reissue of Rockarola, the first album by Judas Priest. But before that, it was first used for the sci-fi novel Tsar Nova, originally released in 1981. The artist, Melvin Grant, would go on to make five album covers for Iron Maiden, which definitely explains a lot. As for myself personally, I did not have ballistics growing up, but I did have Crossfire, which was basically the exact same game, but with better controls. Oh, it's free. She's beautiful hair Ariel. Romance of the Three Kingdoms is a massive, long-running series of strategy games by Koei. Originally debuting in 1985 for computers and the NES, this week we saw the release of the second one for the Super NES, Romance of the Three Kingdoms 2. Don't be fooled by its primitive UI. This is an incredibly in-depth strategy game. Romance of the Three Kingdoms sacrifices graphical power for some incredibly breathtaking complexity. The amount of options you have is crazy. For starters, you have a bunch of different scenarios to choose from, covering different periods of highly fictionalized Chinese history. And it's not just a contest of which side has more and or better soldiers. There are all kinds of tactics like being able to forge letters, make alliances, and even recruit enemy officers. It also has a multiplayer mode where you can have up to 12 players at a time, albeit all taking turns on the same controller. Screw Mario Kart's battle mode, I know how I'm spending my sleepovers now. I'm just kidding, I don't have 12 friends. As a result, Romance of the Three Kingdoms 2 received positive reception for its impressive scale and complex mechanics. Provided that you can adapt to the dated and slower aspects of the gameplay, Romance of the Three Kingdoms 2 is still a really good early strategy game. Just be sure to keep that instruction manual nearby you, there's, there's a lot going on there. If you're not familiar with Romance of the Three Kingdoms, it itself being based on the ancient 3rd century historical text, The Records of the Three Kingdoms, you've likely heard of one of its many spin-offs. Romance of the Three Kingdoms, the game, would also help spawn titles such as Dynasty Warriors in 1998, which is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game before it became a Musou franchise, Kessen 2 for the PlayStation 2 in 2001, Dynasty Warriors Empire's Dynasty Tactics, and eventually a bizarre crossover episode with Pokemon Conquest, in which characters from Romance of the Three Kingdoms would get into tactical battles with their Pokemon. The franchise is still going. Romance of the Three Kingdoms 14 was released for the PlayStation 4 and Nintendo Switch in 2020. Taking combat off the ground and into the skies is Turn and Burn, released this week in 1992 for the Nintendo Game Boy. It was very ambitious for the time, being a 3D flight simulator, sorta. It proudly proclaimed features like complete 3D movement, a radar, dynamic takeoff and landings. Of course, the Game Boy wasn't exactly a graphical powerhouse, so a lot of sacrifices needed to be made. It bears a strong familiarity to Top Gun for the NES. It's essentially the same concept and gameplay, just crunched down to a Game Boy-sized cartridge. Turn and Burn received decent reviews with praise for its technical achievements. GamePro mentioned how they liked its nifty hardware with a cockpit computer screen and two nicely detailed graphic displays. The game, of course, sucks. It sucks a lot. No idea how game reviewers were so lenient then, because if you try to play it now, you'll only notice how it's a clunky, slow-paced, unexciting title that, quite frankly, probably should not have been made for the Game Boy. If nothing else, it served as a stepping stone for its SNES sequel two years later, Turn and Burn, No Fly Zone. The sequel is much better. There was a long period of time where it seemed like any movie possible would get a video game adaptation. In May of 1992, the movie game was Disney's The Rocketeer. What's an innocent girl like Jenny Blake? Keep your eyes open for this dame. Doing in a dangerous adventure like this? It's got the girl! You kidnapped me. They want to swap Jenny for the rock. She's turning on the charm. This is an emergency. Turning up the heat. Hand them over the rocket. And she's got what it takes. Don't give it to me, Cliff. Stop! To take on the world. Backward. The Rocketeer. Rated PG. Now playing at a theater near you.
The movie was released in 1991 and is based on the comic of the same name. It tells the story of a stunt pilot turned jetpack wielding superhero. To this day, it's still fondly regarded as one of Disney's hidden gems. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for its video games. The Rocketeer was made for the NES and SNES with both games playing very differently. The NES version came out closer to when the movie did and is a below average platformer. The SNES version is a below average everything. It tried to cram in so much. Racing, shooting, fighting, all of it sucked. Okay, the comic book style cutscenes are actually pretty cool. Ideally, a game should stick with a few concepts and try to make them work. This one didn't. The first two levels are a bizarre plane flying sequence that is so incredibly difficult and frustrating, most people never get to see the later levels in which you actually get to be the Rocketeer. Those levels include janky, nauseating shooting galleries, followed by more awful flying stages, a boring shoot 'em up with enough slowdown to make it feel like it lasts an eternity, and finally, a clumsy, awkward beat 'em up section. It's known now that the Rocketeer sucks really bad. And when it came out in the 90s, reviews weren't kind either. Electronic Gaming Monthly called it underwhelming, but they did give it praise for its quote, innovative and exciting graphics. In fact, all four reviewers for EGM basically said it had good graphics. Wow, the hottest graphics we've ever seen introduces a sense of reality never before seen on the Super NES. Sets a new standard in video game animation. Superb! It's like playing the fucking movie! Re really, man? Are we looking at the same thing here? Only the Lego Maniac knew what night would bring. Most hauntingly put. The Lego System Castle Collection. Hell Laboratory is best known for making the Kirby series and the Smash Brothers franchise, but before all of that, they were making some pretty niche Nintendo titles. Mock Rider, Balloon Fight, and the Adventures of Lolo series. Also this week, they came out with another niche title, Arcana for the Super Nintendo. At the time, more and more RPGs were moving away from the first person view made popular by games like Wizardry. This was when side and top views were becoming more common. Arcana still uses the classic first person view. Though it does represent characters and enemies as cards, it is not a card based RPG, it's just how they look. Gameplay wise, Arcana is a typical first person dungeon crawler. Move around through mazes, get into random battles, level up, and gather powerful equipment and magic spells. However, Arcana also boasts another feature being soul crushingly difficult. You know how in some RPGs it's game over when your party dies? In Arcana, it's game over if any of your party members die outside of the elemental summons. This is on top of limited save points and spikes in difficulty, and Arcana is not exactly something that I would call. The story isn't too far off from what you'd expect in a 90s JRPG. Ancient evil awakens after being sealed away, a hero is the last of his race, the usual. This is naturally told us through a lengthy intro sequence- <gasps> That's Kirby right there! Look! That's Kirby! Right there! In fact, this is the first official appearance of Kirby. Kirby's debut game, Kirby's Dream Land for the Game Boy, would not come out in the West until August. And even in Japan, Arcana precedes Kirby's first game, by a month. It also just so happens that this game's composer, Jun Ishikawa, would later go on to be a part of the Kirby series. As was the style at the time, Arcana had a wildly different cover in Japan. They got this awesome piece of the main character surrounded by all these monsters and posing with cards in such a way that it would do Yugi Moto proud. Meanwhile, we got this generic fantasy lady. She doesn't even appear anywhere in the game. This box art is worse than some of my YouTube thumbnails. I've talked a bit more extensively about Arcana in a previous video already. Feel free to check that out. I'll put a link in the description. At the time, Arcana wasn't exactly being talked about or topping any charts. Speaking of, Magazine GamePro gave it a generally positive review, but they also listed its challenge as beginner. I don't know what else they were playing at the time, but I'm telling you, Arcana is no joke. Another obscure game released this week in 1992 is the NES title, B-52. Now when you think of shoot 'em ups what comes to mind? Spaceships, lasers, explosions, robots, all that stuff. In fact, this was so commonplace that when games like Xevious in 1942 were taking place on Earth, they were given all kinds of praise. They wanted to go one step further with that. In B-52, you play as a bee, hence the title. Only one bee though, I don't know where the 52 comes from. You can really tell they put a lot of effort into this one. Right off the bat, the game is very unique. 
You're not fighting against spaceships and aliens. You're a perfectly normal bee just trying to get some honey. Your obstacles are common household pests and devices. You can even wiggle your little bee butt. Because of this, the objective isn't shoot everything that moves, it's to explore the level and get nectar from the flowers. You're allowed to explore the stages freely and even have a melee attack. Despite getting a positive review from GamePro, B-52 didn't really leave an impact. This may have less to do with the game and more to do with the game's publisher, Comerica. Comerica was known for making a few NES games, all of them unlicensed. They never got the official okay from Nintendo to make games for their console. It's why B-52 in all Comerica games come in these weird gold cartridges, and on the back, it has a dip switch that you could flip to get past the NES lockout chip. Now, this did cause Comerica to get sued by Nintendo repeatedly, and every single time, Comerica won. However, one year after B-52's release, they went out of business, so did they win, really? Sega got a release this week in 1992 with Kadash for the Sega Genesis. In this day and age, practically every game comes out with some kind of RPG element. At bare minimum, it usually has experience points and leveling up. Kadash was an arcade game released in 1989 and is an action platformer with heavy RPG elements. You level up, learn new spells, and can buy items with gold. This was considered to be really innovative because arcade games just didn't have the staying power that you would expect from RPGs. I struggle to call it a pure action RPG since it's not as mechanically deep as, say, Secret of Mana. You have four different characters to play as, the fighter, the mage, the priestess, and the ninja, all with different strengths and weaknesses. Kadash for the Genesis is a port of the arcade game, though it wasn't the first one. The first port was for the TurboGrafx-16, several months earlier. The ports rebalanced the characters and also made some alterations to the level layouts. It also dealt away with the pesky timer that plagued the arcade version. Understandably, the console versions only have up to two-player co-op. What is not understandable is that you cannot play as the priestess or the ninja in the Sega Genesis version. It also has a boss entirely removed, making this the weakest version of Kadash you could play. In general, people still love the arcade version of Kadash. The Sega Genesis port? Not so much. The Sega-centric magazine Megaplay would not review it until the following October, and even then, they didn't treat it too kindly. One reviewer even criticized it for having the tired Save the Princess trope, and another reviewer stated, and I quote, This version offers you the privilege of four playable characters, which it definitely doesn't. Reviews used to make no sense at the time. These days, everyone knows the Yoshi games for being these cute, adorable platformers that's all about eating all kinds of fruit. But long before any of that, Yoshi got his debut game for the NES, aptly titled Yoshi, released June 1st, 1992. When Super Mario World came out for the Super Famicom in 1990, the introduction of Yoshi did something for Nintendo that was incredibly rare for games at the time. Yoshi appealed to both children and adult women. Knowing an opportunity when they see one, Nintendo quickly greenlit a spin-off starring Yoshi for the aging NES system. This was also to show that Nintendo was going to continue supporting the NES after the SNES came out. Now in the 90s, when the Super Nintendo came out, parents were upset. They felt that their investment into the 8-bit machine was wasted. The old console, now obsolete. Just in time for Christmas, the Japanese toy maker Nintendo has come out with a new set of electronic video games. At $200, a Super Nintendo setup costs twice as much as the old system, and you can't mix and match. Some parents are refusing to be taken in. I'm going to say no, and I'm going to explain to him how people market things to make you spend more money. Nintendo controls 80% of the video market, though some game players prefer the pictures of its competitor, Sega. Some of the new games look like updated takes on fairly well-known formats. In the racing game of F-Zero, you're in a futuristic race car. Oh, I guess I should watch where I'm driving instead of talking. If you're a real good player, meaning you've got the skill of a 9 or 10-year-old, you can even try to jump your car. Ken Shocknick, Channel 4 News.
Nintendo pivoted their marketing strategy by saying that the Super Nintendo was for advanced players seeking new challenges and that the NES would continue to get games that are perfect for the casual gamer. One of their ways that Nintendo was going to prove this was by releasing Yoshi. In a game called Yoshi, about Yoshis and starring Yoshi, naturally you play as Mario. Enemies slowly drop down onto different plates and use Mario to swap them around. However, get these enemies onto an eggshell and then close it with an eggshell top, it'll consume itself and hatch a new Yoshi. The more enemies there are as food, the bigger the Yoshi. From a cute little baby Yoshi to what can only be described as Big Chunk Yoshi. That's pretty much it. That's the entire game. There would be a Game Boy version of this released one month later. There's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. Because here comes Yoshi. And he's up against Goombas, Goobers, Boobuddies, and Piranha Plants in Nintendo's new snack and sandwich puzzle game called Yoshi. Match the creatures and wipe them out. Play alone or with a friend. But mix them and you won't stand a chance. It's challenging. It's overwhelming. Hey, Yoshi! It's Yoshi, the new puzzle game for Game Boy or NES. Now you're playing with power. Yoshi was developed in only six months. The developer at the time had this really ambitious RPG that they wanted to work on, but they needed some funding to keep the company afloat while they worked on their grand idea. So when Nintendo approached them about making Yoshi, they gladly accepted for the extra income while they worked on their big idea. That development studio is called Game Freak, and their ambitious RPG idea would eventually become Pokemon. Pokemon artist Ken Sugimori created the gameplay concept for Yoshi, and the music was done by longtime Pokemon composer Junichi Masuda. Growing up, I only played the NES version a little bit, but I did own the Game Boy version, and I played that more than Tetris. And the game is... okay. It's a simple puzzle game with not a whole lot of staying power. The novelty of seeing the different sized Yoshi hatch wears off really, really quickly. Yoshi received fairly positive reviews at the time, praising its fast-paced gameplay and fun visuals. Nintendo Power graded it with an average of a 3.7 out of 5 and graded the Game Boy version with an average of a 3.6 out of 5. Having played it a bunch myself, I'm telling you these days, it's a different story. Upon its re-release for the Wii's Virtual Console in 2000, Seven, Yoshi received middling reviews from outlets, with the main criticism being that the gameplay simply isn't engaging enough. And they're right, the gameplay is boring. But I guess at the time, everyone was just too excited to see more Yoshi. This week also featured a couple of arcade games coming home, one of them being Thunder Spirits, released this week for the Super Nintendo. You see, Thunder Spirits is actually a port of Thunder Force AC in the arcade, and Thunder Force AC is actually a port of Thunder Force 3 for the Sega Genesis. So if you're curious about the name change, the biggest theory has to do with the co-owned copyright of the original. The developer, Technosoft, and the publisher of Thunder Force 3, Sega. Gameplay-wise, it's neat. Unlock a lot of shooters where you stick with one weapon and upgrade it. Thunder Spirits lets you switch between five different weapons. Unfortunately, the SNES version of the game comes with a problem. Compared to the Genesis version of Thunder Force 3, Thunder Spirits has occasional slowdown. In general, the SNES version didn't really offer much in terms of new content other than a new soundtrack and some graphical adjustments. Reviews for Thunder Spirits were positive, but the slowdown was a big mark against it. Now, since then, Sega has announced that they have obtained ownership of the Thunder Force IP, allowing them to properly re-release Thunder Force 3 for the Nintendo 3DS as part of Sega Classics Collection 3. The other arcade game this week is Ninja Commando, released for the Neo Geo on May 29th, 1992. Ninja Commando is a top-down shooter, in the same vein as Ikari Warriors, Pocky and Rocky, or the Master System's Rambo. Move up on the screen throwing all kinds of projectiles to destroy everyone and everything in your way while doing ninja flips using ninja magic and all kinds of other cool ninja things. Personality was injected into the gameplay by having the characters shout things next to their life bar, saying things like, Yeah! Fire attack! Order! Ah! And 
dead. It has a surprising amount of cutscenes for an arcade shooter. The story scenes feature the main characters with such memorable names as Joe Tiger, Rayar Dragon, and Ryu Eagle. They battle the evil Spider and stop him from using a time machine to destroy both past and present, bringing the players through different stages such as World War II, the Chinese era of the Three Kingdoms, and the Stone Age. Fun fact about Ninja Commando, it released May 29th, 1992 for the Neo Geo AES home console. It released worldwide in arcades May 30th, 1992, one day later, technically making this a home console game first. Ninja Commando would see re-releases, the first one being for the Neo Geo CD in October of 1996. It would see itself on the Wii's Virtual Console in 2008, and it's available for download right now on the Nintendo Switch. When it came out, Ninja Commando received high praise for its graphics, animation, and fun. In Game Informer issue number 6, it received the review scores of 6.75, 8.75, and an 8. The review even states that, with so many moves, it'll keep your thumbs pumping for some time. It's an arcade game at home where you have a memory card that some time is about 30 minutes. This is either going to be something you've never heard of, or if you have, some neurons are about to be activated. Released this week in 1992 is Todd's Adventures in Slime World for the Sega Genesis. You play as Todd, exploring the slime world. You essentially go from room to room, defeating all kinds of slime creatures while using several gadgets along the way, like a jetpack, shields, and bombs. Rather than taking damage or losing health, Todd gets covered in slime, and pools of water can be used to wash off the slime and keep that jumpsuit clean and to reload. It also features two-player split-screen multiplayer, as seen in other Genesis games like Toe Jam and Earl and Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Rather than simple difficulty levels, you instead chose between seven different variations of the game. These options include an easy mode, the harder arcade mode, a mode where you don't have any weapons, a time trial, a PvP mode, and a mode with one life, one death. All of these game modes put Slime World a bit ahead of its time. Imagine if all modern games came with options for stuff like roguelikes and randomizers, that's essentially what Slime World did. Todd's Adventure in Slime World was originally released for the Atari Lynx in 1990, and then it was ported over to the TurboGrafx CD in 1991, boasting new visuals, improved music, and anime cutscenes with full voice acting. Then, when that version was ported to the Sega Genesis in 1992, they got rid of all of that, although they did keep the handy minimap up in the corner. The game is still a bit jagged when it comes to screen scrolling. Understandably, the Atari Lynx version had 8 player multiplayer, the Sega Genesis one, you're gonna have to settle for just two. Slime World is an interesting example where every different version of it had different box art. The Lynx, the TurboGrafx CD, and the Genesis. And for the most part, I would say they're all equally pretty good. The Lynx version has a horde of slime monsters behind Todd, who has a Giga Chad chin 30 years before I even knew what that meant. The Turbo CD version features more of the cutscene characters in that fantastic early 90s anime style. The Japanese Genesis version of Slime World has Todd shooting an alien's jaw off at point-blank range, and in the American Genesis version, Todd's waist-deep in alien blood, grabbing one by the eye stalk, looking like a total badass as he shoots another one with his water gun. And that's not censorship. You actually do fight all the slime aliens in the game with a squirt gun, and now you're starting to realize that this is just Super Mario Sunshine. At the time, there were a lot of reasons to love Slime World. The early 90s were all about slime. Thanks to the popularity of the TV series, you can't do that on television, which was then taken a step further by Nickelodeon Studios by integrating slime into everything they possibly could. Reviews for Slime World were positive for the most part. It got plenty of praise from gaming outlets, though you could say it was Divided. One EGM reviewer awarded it an 8 out of 10, but another EGM reviewer gave it a 4 out of 10. As for what people are saying about Todd's Adventure in Slime World now, nothing. No one is talking about Todd's Adventure in Slime World. Although I will say this about it, I am getting really tired of constantly staring at the color green. Though I do suddenly want to buy some Gak. What is Gak? Gak is great stuff. Oozy. <laughs> Gag is dead!
You can pull it. Make gack sounds. How rude. Suck it up and squirt it out with a gack back. Pump it up and blow it up with a gack inflator. Well, I never. Nickelodeon gack comes in different colors, sizes, and play sets. Each sold separately. Coming soon from Mattel. Disgusting! Not to make you stare at more green, but another game released this week for the SNES is Super Soccer Champ from Taito. Super Soccer Champ is a soccer or football game for the Super Nintendo, only with faster paced arcade style action. Think something closer to Tecmo Bowl than say FIFA. In fact, even has little cutscenes that play anytime you score a goal, like Tecmo Bowl. Taito attempted to add authenticity to the selectable world teams by having realistic depictions of the player's faces appear in the corner. And those results can be described as the Crypt Keeper. That is the Crypt Keeper. Super Soccer Champ would go on to get sequels in Japan. Turns out that arcade-style action made it perfect for an arcade cabinet. Thus, the sequel, named Hat Trick Hero 93, released one year later in Japanese arcades. The series would go on to get yearly installments, ending with Hat Trick Hero S for the Sega Saturn. Super Soccer Champ's sequel was originally going to be released over here, but its US release was canceled and Hat Trick Hero 2 remains in Japan only. Despite not being all that fondly remembered, Super Soccer Champ was remade in 2021 for mobile devices, albeit with a different developer and publisher, different gameplay, different mechanics, and different teams, and you know what? I'm starting to think they just wanted to use the name. If sports aren't your thing, perhaps RPGs are. Also released this week is Cosmic Fantasy 2, released June 9th, 1992, for the TurboGrafx CD. In the early to mid 90s, the SNES was the place to be for RPGs. Aside from all of the Square stuff, there was Lufia, Breath of Fire, the Quintet Trilogy, and tons more. The Sega Genesis also had some good RPGs, thanks to series like Shining Force and Fantasy Star. So what did the TurboGrafx have for RPGs? Well, it had Cosmic Fantasy 2. For the time, Cosmic Fantasy 2 was fairly impressive, being the first RPG to have fully animated cutscenes with voice acting, though it's aged about as well as you expect. Despite the presentation, the gameplay of Cosmic Fantasy 2 is incredibly basic. You know how in every other RPG, enemies have all kinds of attacks and spells, you have to worry about what your enemy's gonna do and what spells or special moves they're gonna do? Well, in Cosmic Fantasy 2, you don't. All enemies, including every single boss, will only use a basic attack. And there is no such thing as critical hits or even missing. Battles also harken back to an already dated look, being more like Dragon Quest 1 several years after the fact. Add a high random encounter rate and you got a game that really shows its age. This was also on the TurboGrafx CD, which means every single time you got into an encounter, you would have to wait for that CD to spin just to load the battle and the music. But hey, it's got those cutscenes. Cosmic Fantasy 2 caused a lot of confusion because where was Cosmic Fantasy 1? The rest of the Cosmic Fantasy series never left Japan, and 2 only made it over to the West thanks to the publisher Working Designs. From what we could gather, allegedly there was going to be a release for Cosmic Fantasy 3 here, but those plans fell through. As was the style for Japanese games at the time, we got a very different box art for the English release. The Japanese box art for Cosmic Fantasy 2 shows the actual characters as they appear in the cutscenes, whereas the American box art, it looks like a middle schooler borrowed a how to draw high fantasy book from their school library. This wasn't the only thing that was changed in the English version. Originally, the main character Rim had instances of giving the middle finger, which was removed. They also changed the ending theme by slightly adjusting some notes and re-recording the vocals so it sounds more like a power ballad, which that alone is worth listening to. Upon release, Electronic Gaming Monthly gave praise to Cosmic Fantasy 2, although one reviewer did say that it could use some spunk and attitude. However, in the EGM Buyer's Guide 1992 Awards, the best RPG of the year of all the consoles was given to Cosmic Fantasy 2, saying that it has a huge world, dozens of cinemas, and realistic sounding voice, and that it blows all other RPGs away to date. This means that EGM thought Cosmic Fantasy 2 was better than, and I'm just thinking off the top of my head here, Arcana, Ultima Underworld, Soul Blazer, Final Fantasy, Mystic Quest, why not? 
Reviews used to make no sense at the time. However, Cosmic Fantasy 2 did appeal to owners of the TurboGrafx CD. In fact, the game sold in an almost one-to-one -one ratio with the TurboGrafx CD unit itself. In 2009, publisher Sunsoft, best known for games like Blaster Master, announced that they had acquired all of Telenet's catalog and they teased a potential re-release of the Cosmic Fantasy series. But that was also 13 years ago, so I wouldn't get your hopes up. Tonight, Maggie Simpson speaks for the very first time, and only guest voice Elizabeth Taylor knows what she'll say. Some things from the 90s are just so iconic, they're still around to this very day. And you know exactly what I'm talking about with Krusty's Super Funhouse, released for the Super NES this week in June of 1992. Decades before it became the poster child of shows well past their prime, The Simpsons were quite possibly the biggest cultural touchstone of the 90s. Their massive success, of course, led to the merchandising and franchising of everything possible. And I mean everything. T-shirts, posters, toys, parade balloons, dish sponges. Of course, this also meant video games, and what a surprise, 90% of them sucked. But it didn't matter, The Simpsons were big, and there was money to be made. We last left Bart Simpson battling deadly space mutants in Acclaim's best-selling video game, Bart vs. the Space Mutants. And now, it's Bart vs. the World! And as Bart mania continues to spread. But Homer still wants Bart to mow the lawn. Bart mumbles he's got better things to do when life is unfair. And now, portable Bart Mania in Bart vs. the Juggernauts for Game Boy. Bart Mania now comes three ways for your NES and Game Boy from Acclaim. Poor Bart. To give you an idea of how aggressive they went on this, that iconic Simpsons arcade game from Konami released in 1991. In 1992, there were five different Simpsons games released across all platforms throughout the entire year. And this does not include ports of previous games, like when Bart vs. the Space Mutants was ported from the NES over to the Sega Master System and the Sega Genesis. Almost all of these games had one thing in common. You played as the most popular character at the time, Bart. Except for Krusty's Super Funhouse, the first Simpsons game of the 16-bit era. Hey kids, it's the Golden Joystick Award! <laughs> the most unsportsmanlike conduct on Game Boy. Bart versus the Juggernaut! Yeah. The best superhero performance on NES, Bart Man meets Radioactive Man! Yeah. The best performance on SNES, oh, Bart's Nightmare! Hey, don't believe it! Are you little... Look for a winning Simpsons video game for every system. Don't forget Krusty's Funhouse! Look at my cook, man, it's ringing. Oh. Rats are invading Krusty's Funhouse on NES, SNES, and Genesis. Lead the varmints into traps and crusterize the little stinkers with help from Trapmaster Bart. In it, you play as Krusty the Clown, who has an infestation of dumb rats in his house, and it's up to you to help them get them into traps operated by other characters like Bart and Homer. It's essentially a platformer puzzler, where instead of just getting to the end of the level, you need to rearrange blocks and pits to get the rats to walk themselves into their death traps. Krusty can also defeat certain enemies by throwing pies into their face. Think lemmings, but you actually want all of them to die to win. All of this within 60 levels. Okay, not really. It's more like five main levels with a bunch of sub-levels in the form of individual rooms. Still, pretty impressive for the time. And now of all the Simpsons games from the 16-bit era, Krusty's Super Funhouse is arguably the best one. Although that's not saying much. This is mostly in part to all the other ones being really janky and frustratingly difficult. And it's also in part because Krusty's Super Funhouse is a reskin. Originally released as Rat Trap for the Amiga one year earlier in 1991, the gameplay aesthetic, even most of the sprites are exactly the same. The purple-haired kid was changed to Krusty, Bart, Homer, and Sideshow Mel were added to the extermination machines, the rats were made slightly more Simpsons-y, I guess? It was also ported to the Genesis and had versions on the NES, the Master System, the Game Gear, and MS-DOS all in 1992, and a Game Boy version in 1993 but all of those would drop super from their title. Being a game based off of a massive franchise, naturally it was featured prominently by gaming outlets. Video games and computer entertainment made it their feature game for their 42nd issue. Nintendo Power's June 1992 issue also had maps and guides for Krusty's Super Funhouse, which, unironically, also had lemmings 
as the cover. In the same issue, Nintendo Power also reviewed the game, giving it an average score of a 3.6 out of 5. Hey, did you know that The Simpsons actually predicted Rocket League? Planning. He shoots, he scores. <laughs> Perfect form, sir. Well, that's actually false because Space Football One on One did it first, released this week for the Super Nintendo in 1992. As I mentioned last week, sports games are incredibly common. So how do you make one that stands out? Set it in outer space, throw some obstacles in the way, and make it first person. The one-on-one -on -one aspect of the game is pretty apt. You don't control an entire team, but rather a single player. And by a player, I mean a hovercraft. It uses the SNES's Mode 7 to rotate the field around you and make it feel like you're really scooting around after an orb. This is harder than it sounds as the ball is constantly flung around and you can only hold onto the ball for about four seconds before it launches off. Also weird, you don't press up on the D-pad to go forward, pressing up on the D-pad automatically turns you to the direction of the ball, and then you go forward. Also, also weird, you can't actually launch the ball into the goal, you have to carry it in. For the record, the box art shows them shooting lasers at each other. There are no lasers in Space Football 1-on-1, -on -one. at least there's two players? GamePro gave it a full page favorable review, though they did say it's not really doing anything new or exciting, which would be correct since Space Football 1-on-1 -on -one has the exact same concept as Ball Blazers, which was released for the Atari 7800 eight years earlier. Speaking of ideas that shouldn't be on consoles, the Genesis got Warrior of Rome 2. Known in Japan as Ambition of Caesar 2, as the name implies, it takes place in ancient Rome. You play as Julius Caesar commanding your army. It's pretty ambitious as it both looks and functions very similar to a PC game. Construct buildings, create units, and go to war. Only with one standout difference to a PC game, everything is so cramped. The words can't even fit into the text boxes, resulting in many hilarious half words like unit staff, enemy in, where will you form the new unit? And who's a Orchis. Controls are also incredibly slow and clunky, as you have to use the D-pad to slowly move the cursor around on the screen. Now, the Genesis did get a mouse controller called the Sega Mega Mouse, which would be used for certain Genesis games. Warrior of Rome 2 does not support the Sega Mega Mouse, one of the few instances where it would have greatly improved how the game plays. Even more insane, you can play this two players simultaneously, just in case things weren't clustered enough for you already. The back of the box for this one made an absolutely massive claim. Over 15 maps to conquer and hundreds of hours of gameplay. Keep in mind, this is in a time where just 10 levels was considered to be a huge selling point. And a game that could have hundreds of hours of gameplay was absolutely ludicrous. In fact, I think the box is telling the truth. Hundreds of hours of gameplay. 80% of that is very slowly moving your cursor around the screen with your D-pad bit by bit. In any case, Warrior of Rome 2 did receive positive reviews. GamePro praised it for its strategic depth and called it a giant step forward in the war simulation category. At the Summer Consumer Electronics Show in 1993, Warrior of Rome 3 was shown, or at the very least, discussed. In fact, Warrior of Rome 2 was also slated to come to the Super Nintendo, although that version never came out, and neither did Warrior of Rome 3, effectively ending the series right here. Nerf Master Blaster Double Barrel Pump Action Power. It's Nerf or nothing. If there's one thing that's true about the world, it's that anything and everything can be capitalized on. Look no further than this week's first game, Gary Kitchen's Super Battle Tank War in the Gulf, released this week in 1992 for the Sega Genesis and the Super Nintendo. Super Battle Tank War in the Gulf is about everything it sounds like in the title. You play as an M1 Abrams tank, during the Gulf War and Operation Desert Storm. As a tank, you slowly roll around and shoot other tanks. It's first person with the tank view where about two thirds of the screen is covered up by the tank and you only have a few small windows to see any action with the tank's turret slowly pivoting up above. It's a lot of wasted space, but the HUD is kind of cool as it displays all of your information
ammunition in a more immersive way. You can see a mini map, how much armor you have left, and the ammunition for your cannon, smoke screens, and uh, the tank's laser. From there, you can swap to an overhead map, moving a tiny tank spec around to find targets to blow up. For the time, these graphics were considered very impressive as the tanks and the people in the briefing screen were digitalized, making them look super realistic. The opening even had a pseudo FMV effect by having several stills of a real tank playing quick sequence. The game's box also boasted that it had blistering sound effects, which uh, not so much. Honestly, it sounds like they used the exact same shot sound effect as the pistol for Doom. As stated in the title, Gary Kitchen's Super Battle Tank was designed and developed by Gary Kitchen. Gary made a name for himself in the 80s by making some absolute successes, namely porting the arcade hit Donkey Kong to the Atari 2600, an accurate port that sold over 4 million copies. He came from an era where third-party publishers, namely Activision wanted to treat their developers the same way a record label would treat their musicians, with royalties and their name on the game's box. Think Sid Meier's Civilization, David Crane's A Boy and His Blob, or John Romero's Daikatana. It was because of Gary's successes that he went on to form his own studio, Absolute Entertainment. While the first thing they did was a port of the arcade game Crossbow to the Commodore 64, the first original game that they put out was a Boy and His Blob, which Gary helped co-design. After Super Battle Tank, Gary Kitchen's name was not added to any other game they made. Upon release, Super Battle Tank received positive reviews. GamePro Issue 42 liked its challenge and realistic depth. As for today, Super Battle Tank reminds me of a slower on the ground version of Top Gun from the NES. There would be a Super Battle Tank 2 just for the Super NES a couple of years later, and it would also get ported to the Game Boy Advance as Operation Armored Liberty in 2003. Super Battle Tank was also ported to the Game Gear in 1994, and for whatever reason, re released by Majesco for the Game Gear in 2001. Speaking of weird ports, Here's another one. Released this week in 1992 was King's Quest V for the NES. King's Quest is a series that needs little introduction. Created by Sierra Online, it's known for pioneering the point and click adventure genre to new heights by using something called graphics. No more were you just typing in your parsed actions like in Zork. Now you can freely move King Graham around to save his kingdom of Daventry. King's Quest now has nine total entries in the long running franchise, but we're gonna be focusing on just the fifth one. King's Quest V was originally released for home computers in 1990 and was known for having a significant improvement in visuals thanks to VGA graphics and is the first King's Quest title to have a true point and click interface. No text commands here. Also in 1992, it would get a special CD-ROM based re-release that gave it some new features. Most notably, the voice acting that has become so loved and so reviled to this day. Graham, watch out! A poison Now the reason I bring all of that up is because we're talking about the NES version, which has none of that. On one hand, it's incredibly impressive that such a massive game was able to be shrunk down onto an NES cartridge. On the other hand, look at it! It wasn't a good idea to begin with, but Konami did it! Obviously, the beautiful hand-painted graphics of the PC version get reduced down to a muddied mess and the animations limited. The roughest part is that the easy point-and-click interface of the original is now using the NES D-pad to slowly move an arrow around to select anything, making the NES version clunky to play. The port to the NES version also meant there had to be some censorship. Any dialogue or words mentioning or alluding to death or killing had to be removed. Where is Cedric? Over there. Mordak may have killed him. Some instances of nudity or even religious themes also had to be changed. Perhaps the worst change for the console version was that it only had two save slots. Anyone who's ever played any King's Quest game can tell you, you need at least 10 times that amount because one wrong move and the game becomes unbeatable. You never know when you're going to need to restore. There was also a password system that was 15 characters long and just as annoying to enter 
as it was to play the game. Nintendo Power also knew that the NES version just wasn't very enjoyable to play because they wouldn't cover it until Nintendo Power issue 51, which came out in August of 1993, a full year after the game's release. They also kept calling it an RPG and said that it translated well to console, so they were all kinds of wrong. King's Quest V was not the first game to be put onto a home console. That would actually go to the first King's Quest game, which was put onto the Sega Master System. King's Quest V was slated to be released for the Sega CD based on the CD-ROM version that had all the voice acting, but that never came to be. King's Quest would not see itself on a home console again until the 2015 episode-based reimagining simply titled King's Quest. Also released this week in June is another forgotten game, Mystical Fighter for the Sega Genesis. As we've mentioned before, the early 90s were filled with beat-em-ups. We've had fantasy, we've had futuristic, and thanks to Mystical Fighter, there was Feudal Japan. Rather than playing as ninjas again, you play as a kabuki warrior, with the whole game based around Japanese mythology. Characters, enemies, stages, bosses, you name it. Gameplay-wise, it's closer to Golden Axe than anything else. You punch some dudes, but can also pick up magic scrolls for screen-clearing attacks. And the more magic scrolls you have, the cooler it is. You're also able to do a Sonic-style spin dash and a couple of different throws, which apparently was important enough to show off on the game's box art. Mystical Fighter is another one of those games that has a normal mode and a hard mode, but you don't get to see the real ending unless you beat it on hard. Aside from its setting, Mystical Fighter is a pretty generic beat-em-up, with two players across six stages. GamePro issue 35 had a multi-page spread about all of the different beat-em-up games coming out, which included Mystical Fighter. Their review of it basically said that the graphics are nice, the sound effects do their job, but it's repetitive enough to bring it down. They listed it as a respectable third place after Streets of Rage and Two Crude Dudes, for whatever that's worth. Their review of it gave it an overall rating of a this face. 